Welcome to Life Love. This is George G. And the time is right. Welcome to today's guest, the strong and powerful Jorge Quesada. Jorge, are you ready to do this? Let's do it, man. I've been, I've been waiting for it. Thank you so much for the invitation to be with you this morning. I'm excited to have you on. Jorge is the VP of Inclusive Diversity at Granite Construction, where he's working to create a workplace where professionals can learn, understand, and act to create a diverse, equitable, and inclusive environment. Jorge, tell us a little bit about your personal life, some more about your work, and why you do what you do. So, so thanks for the question. I, I think, um, so originally I'm from San Salvador, El Salvador, right? Came uh, to, in 1969 to New Orleans. There wasn't a lot of Jorge's there. So believe it or not, I was George. I became George. And my mom and sister still call me George when they, when they talk to people. But over time, you know, um, I found out who I was. So um, literally, Jorge became my name again. And it was used, especially when we moved to California. But as you mentioned, I'm the vice president of inclusive diversity. We were very specific with that. You know, we didn't want to do just diversity and inclusion, right? Because there, sometimes you just do the diversity and don't do the inclusion. Some companies do the inclusion and don't have the diversity. So we thought, you know, in the company that we have, um, we wanted to be inclusive of all the diversity that we have today, the, the diversity that we want tomorrow here at Granite and the diversity we're going to have into the future. So that's how I would tie it together. Um, the work chose me. I didn't choose the work. Um, I have 35 years of business experience. Um, and I say that in aggregate, 25 of it, I would say about 20 years of it was in the business side. And the rest of the 15 years have been in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Nice. Well, I appreciate all that. The exception of turning your back on George, but you know, we all, <laughs> we all have choices to make. Jorge, yeah. Yeah. So. I still, you know, it's funny <laughs> when people say George, I look, I, sure. I, I still do. Yeah. I still do. Old habits die hard. Yeah. So granite construction, if, if you would give us sort of a thumbnail shot of, of the company. I know it's a massive construction company. Um, yeah. How did, how did you find yourself there? What was it about that company that said we need to be leaders in this space? Yeah, no, I appreciate that question. Um, and I'll tell you, so we are a vertical, vertically integrated uh, construction company, meaning that we do things from um, quarry work where we bring in uh, the aggregates or the rocks, right? And I'm just trying to keep it uh, so sure. I can understand it, right? Um, to actually paving paving roads with asphalt concrete. Um, we build bridges, tunnels. Um, you know, one could argue that, that, that we, we help build the infrastructure, right, of our country. Um, we're in airports. Um, we work for the military. So we have a very diverse portfolio of work that we do. Um, and at a given time, and I tell you, this was probably around 2017 that that not only the board, but our leadership team said, you know, we got to really think about what we want to do with diversity and inclusion. And um, there was a search that was done in 2019, early 2019. And at that time, I was with another company. And so they reached out. And um, I, I think I'm here, like I said, the work chose me. Um, I, I thought, of, what a great opportunity to come into an industry like construction um, where, you know, it's funny, um, I, I, I tell construction companies all the time that we need to do a better job of amplifying, amplifying the opportunities that we have in our industry, because outside people tell our story, right? They'll say that this work is not for women. Mm -hmm. They'll say that, you know, there's no careers for people in construction. Mm -hmm. And coming into this, it, it is amazing the opportunities that we have. It is amazing the talent that we have in this industry. Um, and it is right for opportunity for people. Um, we just need to do a better job of communicating that. So thank you for allowing me to elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah. Well, I'm fascinated. Um, I, I'm fascinated. I have a, I live in Arizona and mm -hmm. we've been growing and growing and growing for, for seemingly forever. And yes. so I've got a lot of friends and, and family members who have worked in as contractors or worked in construction. So I have probably a better understanding of, of the industry than somebody who hasn't had that experience. And so I can definitely see uh, people from the outside saying, well, I'm a female. There's no way I would ever get into that line of work or I am, I'm, I'm, I'm gay. There's no way I'd ever 
fit in at a construction company and Mm -hmm. probably similar thoughts to if I were to look at a career in the military. And I know that certainly our armed forces have been working on this as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I I think it's, you know, great thinking there because I think what happens is I don't know if um, people realize how critical it is to be a, like have a solid team. And I know that that sounds crazy because every company says they're going to have a solid team. But think about this, like we're working in dangerous situations on highways, for instance, people are flying by you. And it's important from a safety perspective that we have the level of cohesion, a level of inclusion that, that requires everyone to be watching each other's back. That's just one simple example. But, but, but I'll tell you that that's the kind of stuff that I've come to realize because I had a bias. Now, you know, I, I appreciate the examples that you had. So, you know, I didn't know this, but my wife showed me pictures of my son when he was four and my daughter when she was two. We were getting him ready to go to a, a Halloween parade. I dressed him as Bob the Builder and I dressed my daughter as Minnie Mouse. Hmm. I was not going to dress her in a construction outfit, right? Because I didn't, ha- my bias prevented me to see what was possible for her. But very quickly, I knew what I, I would want him to become, right? And, and there's a little nuance there that like as parents, like we dictate like the, the bias. And so when I came to the, when I came to Granny, she goes, isn't this funny that, that here you are, you're the DEI guy, right? This diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I went, wow, like, you're right. Like, you know, there are these biases that exist. So um, yeah, no, it's very insightful of you because I think that's the kind of stuff that we want to be able to project to people. I just, I just spent a weekend, I mean, a week over with um, the women of asphalt. So women trying to come into the asphalt industry. And there's a lot of women in that industry. And to your point, I'm a, how could I ever do that work? There's a lot of women that are doing this work and doing it really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. So you've, you've been with Granite for how long? Now going on three years. Okay, great. So that's, 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 that's a good little while. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. You, you, you came in, you recognize your, your wife's like, that's pretty funny that you came from this spot and now you're there. So you walking in and now here we are today. How was, how was the experience been? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's different layers in that question. I would tell you that um, in my 35 years, I've never had to do this work during a pandemic. Hmm. So let's, let's think about that. In 35 years, I've never had to do this work when people were actually then went and worked at home. Okay. And then at the same time, in 35 years, I've never had to do this work with the external pressures and the conversations that are being had around diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Um, We see it in the media all the time. You know, we have issues like the, you know, things like CRT right? We have Black Lives Matter. We have, um, and these are, these are things that are important um, um, that I think we need to have conversations about. But guess what? We can't have them like we used to mm-hmm. because people are at home. And this Zoom environment doesn't allow you to really engage um, in the way that we used to before um, we had, you know, we were, we were together. Um, the pandemic um, also created um, a different like dimension that had to be thought about and, and it occupied that prefrontal cortex, right? That pre in, in your thinking, like, oh my God, do I shake hands? Don't I shake hands? I think coming back to the workplace, people are going to have to learn. It's like, fist, do we fist pump? Do we shake hands? Do we hug again? And I, I share that with you because those are the kinds of things that um, if you focus on your work, you'll never notice the things that are important. You'll never learn to understand people for who they are individually, and you won't know how to act. And that's what we try to teach in this work, right? Literally those three things. Can you notice, can you understand, and can you act appropriately to the difference or similarity that's in front of you? Nice. Notice, understand, and act differently. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that. I, I, I love a good framework. So yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I think, you know, so think about this, right? So people are coming back to the workplace. Some people are coming back with beards, right? You have a beard sure. and they didn't have a beard before. <laughs> and you may have had a bias of having clean fake, mm. like no mustache, no beards. Now they're coming in 
and now you have to like notice like like you have to understand why and then how do you act how do how do you reach out to that person when you it was you that thought like i don't i want people to be clean shaven right or dress dress attire has changed right um there's a lot of articles coming up about what is the new dress code and so there's a real gravitational pull to to go back to um how did they say it? I want the new normal. And, and there's a gentleman by the name of David Rock at the Neural Leadership Institute that said something really profound. He said, you know what, instead of creating a new normal on how it was, why don't we create a better normal hmm. of what it, what it could be going forward? I like that. New normal versus better normal. Yeah, better normal. So fascinating. <laughs> I don't know if you had gray hair before these last three years or not, or hey, that's a, that's another conversation. Yeah. And I don't even know if, if if you have gray hair now. Actually, there's light shining on you. So anyway, <laughs> uh-huh. um, but all the all the things that you've just laid out, how there's so much external pressure on organizations and companies to mm-hmm. to be doing certain things at certain times, and we live in the real world where we're dealing with people that have arrived at this time, doing what they've always done with the biases that they've always had. Mm -hmm. And so how do you think about change? Is it we're making incremental change or we need to change now? You know, um, mm, I I love the way you phrase that question because so first of all, I would tell you that people need to take kind of like a responsibility to for themselves before they can go and lead others, like especially leaders or have conversations with others. So when you phrase the, the people have had their biases, people have had their beliefs, their values and the way they think to themselves, right? Um, that creates a level of emotion that then you have behaviors and outcomes. So agree with you. I think what we're experiencing now, and and part of me is what I believe that we're experiencing now, is is that we have to find a way of be able to have people share their point of view and not present it as a truth. Hmm. Because sometimes I think people have, you know, hunkered down, bunkered down, um, and, and now they have opinions whether it's an echo chamber of friends that they have, or just the fact that they're at home, I think they've they've um, started formulating like they're not in the office having office conversations, right? Mm-hmm. So now they're having personal conversations that gets filtered because I work, let's say, at Granite. So like I, before I was at Granite, and I thought, oh, Granite values, you know, values, you know. Um, you know, I bleed green kind of thing. And I would go home. Now I'm at home and everything about me, like at 4.30, I'm, I'm taking care of the kids. You know, I'm, I'm helping my wife do this. I'm doing this. Then I go to Granite or I jump on a call. There's, so there's some people that just never went back to the office, right? And, and, and so, so I share that with you because I think you're going to have to do some personal work at, at one level. Then you can go like, it's, it's like within, then you go among, and then you go beyond, right? Like, so how do you do it? And I think when, as people come back, we're going to have to do that work. We're going to have to bring people together. We're going to have to have conversations. We're going to have to say, welcome back to Granite. Remember when we used to do this, this, and this, we'll still do some of that, but guess what? We're going to do something better. Now we're going to do this, right? We're going to have to engage in those discussions, but, but you're right. Um, we haven't had these external pressures that we've had. Um, you know, the, the tragedy of George Floyd uh, created a lot of movement, you know, s- social injustice movement that I could tell you that before that, not a lot of conversation. You know, before that, there was a lot of companies that because of COVID were letting go of people who were doing diversity, equity, and inclusion. After the death of George Floyd, all of a sudden, a bunch of companies started hiring people, started putting out messaging that they never put out before about diversity, equity, inclusion, and where they stood. And, 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 and I share that with you because that all happened in a very compressed time, right? So these are the kinds of things that we've been working through. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a lot. And, <laughs> and uh, it, I mean, goodness. Uh, so, so I certainly appreciate, appreciate your work, the ability to share a point of view, but not to, uh, not to hold on to it as not, not, not to present it as, as truth. Yes. To, to really hold on to, to be strong in our ideas, but or to, hmm. What is the term? Don't 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 hold on to your ideas. Be convicted, but don't hold on to your ideas. Be 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 willing to change your mind about things. And I I I don't like the term safe space, Jorge. But mm-hmm. that's really what we're that's what what's required to be able to actually bounce ideas off of one another. Yeah, you know, I think we have to right, and 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 I think so. I'm kind of like I have a different point of view about safe space, but but. But I think I think I can understand why the term gets kind of like squishy or, or like weird to some people, right? Um, I, I think what we're trying to say is, and, and, and Amy Edmondson talks about psychological safety, right? And she talks about how important it is to feel to feel comfortable being able to have a conversation with someone without ridicule, without feeling like you're being something's being held against you. Because it's in the spirit of being able to share that also belonging comes into place, right? When you and I can talk, then you and I can build the bond. And then I know that around you, I can have a good conversation. Mm-hmm. And, and so you know, to say, yeah, we, you and I can have a safe, share a safe space. I get that, right? But I think, you know, I, I, yesterday, uh, Tim, Tim Urban, I, I wrote it down here. The joy of finding out that I am wrong is the only way you know that you're learning anything. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I think when we come at it with, no, my way is the truth without you opening up your aperture of what's possible, what's different, doesn't allow you either to grow or doesn't allow you to relearn or learn something. You know, Adam Grant has that book again, Think Again, that really is challenging our thinking about that, right? I, I think um, whether you read, you know, Stoicism or you, Marcus Aurelius or stuff like that, that's those guys were thinking about that stuff. They were thinking about like, you know what? It's about the learning. It's about the relearning and unlearning at times that we get better. And this work requires that type of uh, muscle to build that you learn, unlearn, relearn, learn, and doing it constantly. And sometimes when you hold on to your truth, it, you don't allow yourself that opportunity to grow that way. Yeah, totally agree. You were talking and I wrote down a, a trusting space. Mm-hmm. So, and it's just, it's just, it's, it's just a word, right? It's a safe space and mm-hmm. it, you know, whatever. Yep. It's, 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 it's my problem. Certainly not safe spaces <laughs> problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. <laughs> but trusting that I'm entering into mm-hmm. uh, an interaction or a dialogue with somebody who is being genuine about coming and meeting me where we both are and learning from one another Mm -hmm. that strikes me as your opportunity, your challenge within a big organization with lots of pressure. It does. You know, at Granite, we say that, um, and we, um, Andres Tapia, he works at Corn Ferry right now. um, And he had this phrase that defined diversity and inclusion. He said that diversity is the mix and inclusion is making that mix work. Mm -hmm. At Granite, we believe that but we practice inclusive diversity, right? Like we're very intentional about our inclusive, inclusive diversity practice. But what you just said, right? What resonates for me is, is that we have to have the ability that, to believe that we're in an environment that we can have this conversation. Because then what we, be, what we become, right? We become more open to the possibility of, of, of moving the work forward and then ultimately, when you have that, you have the belonging that we all crave. We all want to be part of something, mm-hmm. right? That as humans, that's 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 in us. That's in our DNA to belong. And so that belief, that becoming, and that belonging is so important for us from a, a mental health perspective as well. You know, there's a lot of there's studies out there that says that if you feel excluded or you feel like you don't belong, it's like like taking a a, a punch to the gut. That's the type of physical thing that your body goes through, your brain, the chemicals in your brain goes to when you feel like you were excluded from something. And so mm-hmm. this is why 
this work is so important beyond just the representation thing that that people try to hijack the word diversity for, right? It's it's about, oh, we need more XYZ people here. We need this, we need that. Yes, we do. But it's the inclusion and how to make it work without that piece, all that representation piece goes right out the back door because we're not creating the environment for people. That's right. Like that that's really well said, sir. Well, Jorge, that was that was solid right there. But people are ready for your difference making tip. What do you have? Oh, <laughs> you know, you know, um, you put me on the spot on that one. But I will tell you this: I would tell you that if we can wake up to live like an amazing story, like challenge ourselves to live an amazing story, uh, that's the first thing. The second thing, if you can love generously to create that type of environment that you and I have been dancing around talking to, right? That space. And then if we can inspire to show people um, that things, yes, may appear to be impossible, but they are possible. So if we can live, love and inspire, my man, that would be awesome. Well, I think that that is great stuff that definitely gets, come on. <laughs> live, love and inspire. It's a world where Georges and Jorge's can 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 live happily together. <laughs> yes, yes, we can, we can. I love it. Well, Jorge, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people learn more about you? How can they engage with you? You know, the best place to get a hold of me is through LinkedIn, right? Jorge Aquesada, and, and I have MBA next to it. Uh, but we also have a podcast with uh, Stacy Roldan and I from Rosaden called Construction DEI Talks. That's construction DEI talks at the S at the end. And you can type that on LinkedIn, Instagram, on Twitter, and you can find our episodes. You can find the conversations that we're having around the industry and this place called diversity, equity, and inclusion. Love it. Well, if you enjoyed this much as I did, show Jorge your appreciation and share today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas. Find him on LinkedIn under Jorge Quesada, MBA, link that in the notes, and then check out the Construction DEI Talks podcast. Um, put it into the search bar on LinkedIn and find it wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks again, Jorge. Thank you. And until next time, keep fighting the good fight. We are all in this together. <laughs>